Welcome to the video on the look around on Russian Hind Mi-24 Hind helicopter. This video will know you everything about the Hind helicopter ever you could want to know. This video is sponsored by Flying Eyes, Air Models and Jones 360 coatings. Many thanks you for watching this amazing video. I hope you likes and subscribes many times. Hi, my name is Bruce Stringfellow and uh, y'all wanted to take a look at the uh, MI-24, so here we are. This is where we start with our typical um, pre-flight of the aircraft. 2250 horse shaft horsepower. This is the starter right here and right here. There's a huffer and APU that we'll show you here later on in the pre-flight. And basically it, uh, it pressurizes here, spins the engine, gets the engine up to speed, then we introduce fuel and then the, uh, the TV3 engines will come to life. We start them one at a time, uh, typically. Just a uh, nerdy fact, normally we try to spread the, uh, the starting on the left engine, the right engine, odd engine, even engine, depending on um, the, the odd day of the week or the even day of the week, just to try and even out the wear and tear on the engines. Um, so this right here is a ventilator. Uh, it ventilates, it takes air, it takes air inside, uh, mixes it and pushes it throughout uh, the back of the aircraft. So we've, we've already looked underneath here, there's no oil. We've looked down here, there's no oil. We'll catch the other engine on the way out of here. Then we get over here to the main gearbox. We inspect the rotor hub. We're gonna be inspecting the rotor hub as we move around. We're gonna be looking at the swash plate. Uh, this aircraft was just recently greased. It's, it's flown quite a few hours. It's flown 16 hours uh, in the past month. So it's still got a little bit of grease flung off here and there. Uh, we did grease it before. So there's gonna be grease clobs all over the place here. Um, but again, we've, we've recently had uh, the swash plate, the uh, uh, rotor head, we've recently had it overhauled. Um, the blades have also been recently overhauled. Again, we've, we've been flying it, so it's a little dirty. It's a little dirtier than I would like to see it. But uh, general rule of thumb inside all Soviet aircraft, from this era anyway, is uh, it's color-coded. If it's red, it has to do with fire. If it's yellow, it's fuel. Um, if it's sort of this, uh, this aqua color, I guess, right here, it's hydraulic. Um, black, I don't see any black. Black is typically pneumatic. Ah, here's some black right here. So uh, this is the uh, this is what we dry the air whenever it comes in. It compresses. So we've got black there. And then uh, have we seen brown yet? Have I mentioned brown? I may have already said brown's going to be engine oil, uh, either engine oil or gearbox oil. Ah, there's some brown back over here. It's out of view. You'll be able to see that right right over in here. Well, we've kept everything as native uh, as we can on the aircraft, and. Uh, so we, we have come in and taken things down, cleaned them, and repainted them. But for the most part, you can see the fire lines, we haven't done anything there. These are hydraulic pumps right here. Um, you're going to have a, a backup hydraulic and a utility right here. On the other side, we're going to have the main hydraulic. So let me go ahead and open this up. This is the hydraulic compartment right here. The, uh, the hydraulic block right here. We've got our hydraulic engine, uh, in, in, we've got our hydraulic level right here. Uh, this is going to be the main, and then I'll have the facility and the backup uh, gauges are, we'll be able to see those on the other side. Helps the pilot to relieve load off the pilot during flight. And uh, that's about all I know about this. It's, it's a big mixer box, there's some electronic here. We've replaced all the hydraulic hoses with braided hoses, going back to the hydraulic actuators on all four of the axes. So generally, again, on our pre-flight, we're looking for oil spots. You can see the deck is reasonably clean, and we've got a pretty good coat of paint on there. And we're just looking for, for any kind of new oil leak, grease again. We're just going to be picking up grease as we go on our pre-flight here. Um, but we're looking for oil spots, and like you say, you know, the hydraulic would be red, red oil. We're not seeing any of that on the ground. Here's oil level on the APU, and then generally making sure that it's nice and secure. The... Uh, 
The APU, like I said earlier, it's a huffer, so it's generating uh, air pressure and air volume. And then if you look at the black pipe on the other side, uh, that's what's routing the pressurized air up to the front. The APU also serves in a capacity as it's uh, the backup DC voltage system. So realize when, when this, was, uh, this was designed, it was designed to be shooting at people and to shoot back. So there's a lot of redundant systems on this aircraft in case people are lucky and, uh, and get a shot in on the aircraft. Pumping fuel from the lower fuel tanks up into the service tanks, then you would need DC power. The APU could be brought on in a pinch and it, there's a generator back there, there's a starter generator here, and you could actually use it as your third uh, redundant uh, DC power. Service tanks uh, actually just gravity feed and mechanically feed the front engines um, with fuel, and, if, um, if, if, and, and they will drain in 30 minutes, so you plan on 20 minutes. And you need to be careful to be in coordinated and level flight while you're doing that, so you're not potentially um, starving one of, the, one of the turbines. You can use the, the uh, generator, uh, it's only rated for 30 minutes of use. Um, but again, if you're in a life and death pinch, you'll run it as long as you need to run it. And that gets you an extra 30 minutes. So that gets you an hour with the, uh, with the batteries, 30 minutes, and then 30 minutes with this, even if you're staying within specs. And again, the, the APU doesn't use that much fuel, so you could leave that for the duration of the flight if you're in a pinch. Um, I'll just point out again, just sort of the color coding here. Um, yellow, this almost could be a quiz, fuel. And you come down, you have the, uh, uh, the fuel comes in um, here, and also the ventilation for the fuel. This may, in fact, be ventilation here. I think it's, this, this appears to be ventilation. Comes into here, and then uh, the right service tank, and the left service tank is right there. I guess we were talking about the service tanks here. There's, uh, there's a number of different voltages. I'm not going to take the covers off those wires, but there's a number of different voltages, AC and DC voltage on the aircraft. And every... Uh, every type of wire has its own special color banding to tell you what voltage you've got. So you've got uh, 208, uh, 208 uh, three phase, um, 400 hertz power, and then you may have a 36 volt three phase power, um, you know, just as example. And then of course DC, 28 volts. I think you've got 28 volts somewhere in the aircraft. You've got five volts, you've got three volts, you've got seven and a half volts. There's a lot of different voltages that are, that, are, uh, that are utilized within the aircraft. So they have, the point, I'm sorry, is that the wires all have their own kind of color code as well whenever you get up under, underneath the covers here. So this is, the, uh, this is the APU. And again, we just kind of continue moving for our pre-flight here. Sort of another nerdy fact, we, whenever we run the aircraft and we actually are going into our destination, if we've used more fuel than are in the service tanks, uh, in other words, we've used all the lower fuel, uh, the aircraft holds, uh, what, 2,150 liters of fuel, and uh, if uh, we've got approximately 300 liters per service tank. So if we're below 600 liters when we come in, we know we, whenever we fill up, we're not actually going to be filling up in the service tank. So what we can do is we can come up here, and it's a little more difficult to do, but we can actually put fuel directly into the service tanks. Alternately, what we do if we're trying to save battery um, at, at remote locations, typically, um, uh, typically if I've got a ground start unit, I'm gonna go ahead and just uh, put fuel into the bottom and then I'll pump it up on the ground since I'm using ground power. If I don't have that and I'm really trying to pack all the fuel I can on this aircraft, I can come up here and put fuel directly in to, uh, into tanks two and tank one. This is the other side. This is our redundant, uh, this is our redundant hyd uh, hydraulic pump here. And again, colors you can see, um, blue, hydraulic, red fire, black is, uh, I guess, pneumatic. Uh, technically it's true, it is pneumatic. This wash plate again is in good condition. Push pull rods are all in good condition, as you can see here. Uh, the hinges are all in good shape. Um, you know, these, these, it's a fully articulated blade system. It's got the lead lag and it's got the flapping uh, all here. The, uh, this, this rotor hub, interestingly, this rotor hub is something that the Soviets used and I guess the, has lived, outlived the Soviet Union. This rotor hub is actually used on uh, MI8s, MI17s, MI14s, MI24s obviously, MI35s, which is the follow-on to this aircraft. And uh, the only difference is there's a little bit of a weight uh, that's in a, where is it? 
there's a there's a, a stop right here there's a droop stop and whenever the rpms achieve a particular whatever that aircraft this one has a maximum has an ideal 100 percent rpm at 240 rounds per minute then what happens is these with the with the centrifugal force these weights will pull back and then the flap so that the, so that these can actually flap more than they're at rest right here so it gives you a little more uh, gives you more maneuverability in flight um, the weights, I, I, the, the, again, the, the blades are heavier, the blades are lighter, then the weights are going to be different. That's the only thing on this rotor hub that's, uh, that's different uh, between all of those different aircraft that were mentioned. So this is not the rotor hub that's used on the really, really large MI helicopter, um, it, the, the, the big, the, the one that could pick up this helicopter, I guess. That, that, this is, it, it's a different rotor hub. So. These are obviously the exhaust pipes here. And then we'll check this engine the same way as we started before, where we're going to come over here, we're going to look up underneath the engine, see if there's any speckles or whatever. We'll look on this side of the firewall, see if there's any oil in there. And then I'll check the oil level. This is where... Uh, we usually go ahead, get our screwdriver, and we go around and check the rest of the aircraft. So I'm uh, just a typical, uh, typical walk around for any kind of problems that might have, uh, any birds or any things that we may have found. We're gonna look in the back, make sure that the crew compartment, that everything is properly stowed in here. And again, we're not traveling today, so, uh, but it's pretty clean. This was designed uh, where you could put eight guys in the back. It would have to be eight small guys. This uh, seat section is here. Another seat section could go in here. Um, two guys on that side, two guys on this side. And yes, these mounts that are right here, uh, everybody has their own mount. And uh, these mounts are for AK-47s. We've put one in there and it fits it. There's a little, there's a little bit of a, a sleeve in there and it fits it like a glove. So. And you can see on the other side of the aircraft, you've got uh, the two there. You would just uh, undo the, undo the uh, straps, pull them over to the center, and then the two guys sitting right here, and then pull those guns up, pull those gun holders up. They've actually, it's, it's kind of cool, they've got some uh, stops in them. So they've put the stops into where you, you can't come back and shoot your, uh, your wing. And you can't go tracking up because again, up, up is kind of relative, right? If you're, in a, if you're in a bank turn and you want to hit somebody off to the side, but your blades are in the way. It's got a little stop to keep you from uh, firing through your blades as well. So uh, crew compartment, again, I'm, I'm on the colors here. You see you got a fuel line running here, and that's just a, uh, that's either a vent or a drain line from the top going down. We have uh, fuel tanks in here. So the one and two, you saw up top, the service tanks. Again, uh, the even odd, so the odd is number one, is on the left, even tank number two is on the right. On the back of this, uh, back of the crew compartment here is a vertical tank. That's tank number three. And then it flows into tank number four, which is kind of in the back half. And then tank, tank number five, there's an interconnect here. So when we're fueling the aircraft, we normally fuel, fuel it above the right wing. So there's a fuel compartment right up here. And uh, that will free fall through three into four. We open the interconnect. So when we're filling it up, we're filling it up through three to four, four and five get filled up and then it backs up into three. And like I said, if we've used up fuel out of tanks one and two, then we've got a little bit of a void. We're not gonna quite be able to get 12, uh, 2150 liters. So we can either put it in the top there, say it's no big deal, or we can use up some of our batteries and, uh, and go ahead and pump some up uh, as, we're, as we're filling up the aircraft. So again the weapon systems on this aircraft like i said earlier weapon systems and the uh, de-icing systems are not active uh, these ubs are not active they're here for show uh, these are ub-32s um, this care aircraft is currently configured on the stores with four of them i want to make sure that no, somebody may have done something in one of these snaps because they have uh, we have we have these right here where we can do quick releases just want to make sure nothing has been uh, quick released because we don't want anything to release in flight. And then you know, just make sure, rotating them a little bit, and then uh, we're coming over here. So the next part is I inspect the landing gear. These are retractable landing gear. And um, what happens is this door right here to your left, it will come down. 
the wheel will kind of do a little twisting motion. It'll fold itself in and then the door comes back up. Uh, we have, we have gear, uh, gear up, gear down indicators in the primary cockpit and the pilot, uh, pilot's cockpit. And then also down in the co-pilot gunner cockpit, we have some lights that indicate whether they're down or not. It's just a single light there. So make sure this is, this is good to go. The wing actually does produce uh, lift and flight. Unlike the Cobra, unlike our Cobra or Apache, the wings on those aircraft don't create lift and flight. And look, there's, there's a lot of controversy about how much lift this actually provides. Um, I, I think numbers range anywhere from 15 to 25 percent. That, that seems sort of reasonable. This aircraft, whenever it gets cruising, its fuel economy gets a lot better. How can that be? Because you're still resting on the, 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 the rotating blade, right? Well, no, maybe you're resting a little bit on the air as well with this wing. This aircraft does a number of things really well, even today. It did things really, really well back in the 80s when it was built. But what it does is it goes really fast. Uh, this, this aircraft will go in excess of 200 miles an hour. Um, yeah, 190 something, 190, 180 something knots, depending on, on what configuration it is. But it goes really fast. Um, and that's one of its defensive and one of its attack modes is to go really fast. The downside is whenever you've got a wing and it's making up a lot of the lift, if you're trying to turn and you don't have any, you don't have anything on the wing to help you with the turn, the turns tend to be very, very stiff. Hence, it's one of the problems with the aircraft is, is, is its asset, is its speed, its vulnerability is it's not very maneuverable whenever you get it to high speed. So you need to be strafing in at a point and leaving a point. Those are the two best things that you can do with this aircraft. If you've got to go in and then make a 180 degree turn and come back out, this is not the right aircraft to be doing that. Now, if you can go out and get away and then make a pass coming back, sure. Again, go, coming and going is what this aircraft does really well. So, uh, battery, battery compartment is right here. Uh, the way we normally have the aircraft is it normally sits like this where the batteries have been pulled out and then as a part of the walk around you'd go ahead and engage the batteries here. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll, I'll show you the exact same thing on the other side of the aircraft. Interestingly, this aircraft did come from Bulgaria and uh, so we're, we're proud of the fact that it came from Bulgaria and uh, we love the Bulgarians and the Bulgarian people and it's interesting because as we started stripping the paint, this aircraft has undergone a full, uh, a full restoration uh, paint job and, and, and a number of the different components we've overhauled. But what we found was as we started taking off layers of paint, we found the Soviet star and then took off a couple of more layers of paint and found the Soviet star with the Bulgarian roundel in, in this was what we thought was, from a history standpoint, this seemed like the coolest thing to do because it not only tracked the Soviet star, which sells it, you know, everybody likes the star, but also it has the personality of the, the Bulgarians. So clearly the Bulgarians, either, either they had special favor with the Soviets to get away with something like this, or they did it and they were so far away from the Soviets. This is an inspection hatch. It's not a, a normal part. On, on a 10 hour inspection, I'll go up there. There's an auxiliary gearbox. What does the auxiliary gearbox do? It steps down the RPMs just a bit. It also has the two primary AC generators on here. So you have two generators, 208 volts, four, uh, 400 hertz, um, 200 amps each. So you got three phase, 208 power, 400 hertz, 200 amps times two. Like, what do you need all that power for? Because that's a lot of power. Well, these blades, to de-ice the blades, you need a lot of power. Again, that's one of the systems that's not active on this aircraft. So we don't use anywhere near the power that's, uh, that, that we generate uh, from, from this configuration. But again, that's, that's what the aircraft was designed for. Uh, that's, the, that's the inlet ventilation for the APU, just to kind of give you a sense of where we are from upstairs to downstairs. So as we move back towards the tail again, we're just looking for anything. This is actually where the, the nose section of the aircraft and the tail section, this is where they split for tra transport and then where they come back together. And so we've just put some, uh, we've put a strip in here and uh, glued it down and then put paint. Yeah, you're looking for brakes in case there was any kind of torquing or whatever else. Another interesting thing is just since we're looking here, this is, this is another interesting thing about all Soviet aircraft. And on this aircraft, you're going to find, and again, the, the detail goes, uh, kudos to my mechanic for doing this. He restored all of the, the lettering. If you'll look, all of the original Soviet lettering on this aircraft are, are restored uh, to what the factory says. There's even some people who did some proofreading of all the stuff when we were putting the, uh, 
uh, when, after we'd painted the aircraft, we finished with a camo layer, we were putting these back on. We had people proofreading and they actually found that there's spelling errors. And so the question became, well, what do we do? And again, to be historically appropriate right here, we like, look, if the factory misspells it, we're gonna keep it misspelled. So there are gonna be some things, especially in the crew cabin, there's a couple of things in there we're told we're misspelled. Like, yeah, that's what the factory did, so. But one of the other, just outside of the lettering, is the detail that he gave right here. These are actually reference points within the aircraft. So if something happened to the aircraft, uh, if, it, if it had a gear up landing, if it had some sort of a torquing event and we were concerned, pilots, you know, we need to check this out to see what happened here. If we had a hard landing, if we had a really hard landing and, uh, and you know, it just felt like everything was jarring or whatever, we'd want to make sure that the frame is exactly square. And so within the logbooks of this aircraft, all of these reference points, there's measurements that have been taken so that we know what the geometry is of the aircraft from the factory. So even when we put it up on, we put it up on jacks, we level everything out, and then we start taking measurements from point to point. And, and uh, there's only like, it's, it's fractional millimeter tolerance here. So once you've done that and you've taken your measurements, if you had a hard landing and you came back, your, your, your mechanic could give you assurance. Nope, you know, it may have been a hard landing. Don't do that again. But the frame appears to be in good shape based on all these reference points. So anyway, I, it's, uh, it's signified by these rivets that have, have some sort of a hole punch in them right here. So it differentiates itself from the other rivets. Um, that's a UHF VHF antenna. I'm using all of the current, the UHF and VHF radios that came with the aircraft, we're currently using those. They're, they're, they're higher wattage than, uh, uh, they're, they're, they're high wattage air, uh, radios, UHF radios, very, very good radios. It's native to the aircraft, it's wired for it, so we're using the intercom and the radios that came with the aircraft. There is options in the uh, hell hole over here to, to uh, where you can add various different electronic components, and we've added a second radio, and that's the uh, UHF VHF radio on the other side. For it. This is a navigational antenna right here. And again, we're just watching, looking at it to make sure it's connected properly. Uh, right here, this is the Doppler antenna. And uh, so I'm told by the mechanics and by the pilots uh, in Bulgaria, the number one system that didn't work was the Doppler system. These two aircraft that we have, the Doppler systems seem to be remarkably stable. So, uh, don't know, again, a testament perhaps to our maintenance uh, staff here, but the, the Doppler system works, it has a Doppler moving map. It's like an Etch-a-Sketch map where it's got this cross that moves around, and I'll show that to you later on. It is, it's just, it's really cool. So it's got Doppler systems. We'll, we'll be able, if we're in a hover in low visibility, we've actually got a Doppler system that we can see how many we can see the rate of um, travel in the fore aft and the left right direction and in the up down direction so it's it's uh it's cool it's old technology yeah we've got gps's on board as well but this it's it's kind of neat um, the other thing that we've got here is a radar altimeter all, all the uh again all these systems have been resurrected and um, uh, there's one of these as a receiver one of them is a transmitter. I have no clue which one is which. I, you know, does it make sense that the front one would be the transmitter? I don't know. Uh, so um, what else? Oh, so this was a this was an aftermarket mod, we'll say. Uh, so back in the days, whenever uh, um, these were the, the these were actually decimating the Afghani's whenever uh, Russia uh, went over into Afghanistan a number of years ago. And so uh, they, 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 this aircraft is it's, it's designed for low-level troop assaults and, and ground uh, ground missions. Although it can handle air missions as well, but it's 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 a it's like an A-10 on on a helicopter. And uh, so the one of the pro oh, what, so what happened? Uh, we had some uh, creative people apparently in the U.S. who decided, hey, let's get some stingers over to the Mujahideen, and we were allying up with the Mujahideen, and uh, so. The Stinger was incredibly effective against this aircraft. This aircraft, that big exhaust pipe that we saw up there earlier on the uh, top, that puts off a huge amount of heat, great heat signature from a lot of different points of this aircraft. So the Stinger was just a natural for taking this thing out of the air. Um, so what, what, what do you do? You're, you're, you're back in you know, Moscow, you're the design bureau. How do we make this thing? So they put some baffles on the exhaust pipes to sort of diffuse the, uh, the heat. Out of uh, uh, out of the exhaust, and then the second thing they did was they put these uh, they they mounted these flare packs on the back to give some uh, decoy heat to the stingers, and it actually did have a great the, the combination of the two 
I'm told, made these things much more survivable. Um, it was something a lot less than 50% survivable whenever it was in theater with stingers, and it went way above 50%. Again, I'm kind of wives' tale here. But anyway, we on this, this is merely, and we don't have the flare system. I would consider this part of the weapon system of the aircraft. This is not active. We're actually looking for some flares to put in here. Um, and, and there, there are, we, we, even though we have no design or no desire to activate the de-icing systems, we have, we have some desires to maybe look at making the, the weapon systems, at least the sighting systems and the, the slewing systems, get, get those up to date and getting working. And then this would be kind of neat also is maybe to see if we could uh, work out something where we could get the flare systems working. But for this, it was just an aftermarket mount. We have to make sure that these are good and tight and that they're ready for flight. Anything, as you know, in helicopters, anything when you get near the tail of the aircraft, the last thing you want, especially in flight, is things coming off and going through the tail rotor. It's just not good. Make sure that our elevator's in good, uh, good shape. These elevators actually move. They move with the collective. So that whenever we're, we're looking to move and we're pulling collective, what's gonna happen is this is gonna move in a way such that it lifts the tail up. So it helps, it helps, the, uh, helps the tail fly up higher so that we can exchange some uh, vertical lift for some, for some thrust. So just make sure this is good. This is uh, covered with, a, with, with some sort of a material here. And uh, yeah, fabric, thank you. And so one of the other things that we do as a part of the pre-flight is we look right here. This is a transition gearbox. So there's a, a shaft that goes from the auxiliary gearbox all the way to here. And then I, we call it a 45 degree gearbox. I don't know if it's 45 or not, but the 45 degree gearbox takes and uh, pushes the rotational power up to here. And then one of the other things that I look at while I'm here is I look up through the lattice and I see the gearbox level in the 90 degree gearbox. And then that takes the, uh, the shaft and then turns the motion out to the other side. Um, this is where the data recorder, so-called black box is. And what we've done in our, in our two uh, Heinz that we have here is uh, we've got a project to do additional things with this, but this is where the black box is right here. What we did was we just put a couple of Hobbs meters here. So this is whenever the power comes on, we, we track that. And then also whenever the gear is retracted, some data to the data recorder sent here to when the gear comes up. So that way we can keep a maintenance hob as well. And when does the gear come up so we can start the, uh, the hobs on the parts. So um, again, we've got a project on the books to uh, put uh, some sort of an engineering project back here to track all the parameters that are being tracked. Um, on, on, we'll put it on some sort of USB drive or something like that. Uh, for all the parameters, the, the airspeed, uh, everything that's sent back to the black box. So this is sometimes called a stinger, I guess, on the uh, on helicopters. Usually there's kind of on a Robinson or whatever, there's got this bar that looks like here. It looks like a stinger on the back of a, a bumblebee or something. But uh, this, and it just serves the function of trying to get an indication to the pilot, hey, dummy, you just put your tail too low and you don't want to bury the blades into the ground. We passed up a couple of these. This is a friend or foe system. I'll show you where it's uh, in the aircraft or where it would be in the aircraft. I'm going to also tell you that's not a system that came with the aircraft. So they didn't take much out of the aircraft when we acquired them, but the friend or foe system, they, they didn't want us to have that. So, uh, but we still have the sensors on here. All right, so we come across here. We look at the blade system. Now, Again, what I'm looking for, there's uh, the three different blades. There's oil. I can see the oil levels in all three of them are in good shape. Um, again, friend or foe uh, sight indicator right here. It was a classic um, push style. So normally a helicopter, you're going to have, uh, you're pushing against or you're, you're pushing against the torque into the tail. Interestingly, they found that they were having a tail rotor issues. They, they were losing tail rotor authority whenever it was in the standard pusher mode. So they flipped the gearbox around and then made it a puller. So this is actually pulling out against the torque and it's called a tractor whenever you pull out against the, uh, the torque. And uh, I don't have the leading and lagging capability, but I have feathering and I have, um, and I have flapping. Yeah, I don't have lead lag. So it'd be a semi-articulated tractor tail rotor system. Again, there's a there's a mechanism inside. These these move together. They're they're not independent moving. Uh, the left and the right elevators are not independent moving. Uh, check this just to make sure it's in good shape. This looks good. Again, radar altimeters right here. These are the original flares that were in the aircraft, and these were just signal flares. Um, 
<laughs> kind of like what we put on our transponder, I guess, whenever we get to the airport, we don't have radio or we don't have a, you know, we don't have something else. So there's a particular, there's, I, I forget the color, there's four colored uh, flares that are in here, pretty much on all Soviet, all Soviet aircraft. And one indicates you don't have radio, one indicates you may have injuries on board, another one indicates uh, some other fire on board or something like that. So this is something to visually signal the tower as you're approaching home or whatever to sort of get some sort of uh, help. Uh, whenever you do land. All right, over here, this is whenever we use ground power. This is a standard 28 volt uh, ground power here. It says 27 volt, as you can see here. So I guess it's 27 volt, but we use 28. Actually, we like to use 30 volts. Uh, it's, it's, it's Russian, so it likes to, everything likes to be bigger, right? So it's just, it, uh, 30 volts works great with our APU. This is this, this, another interesting story. This is um, well, our standard 28 volt ground power units, no problem whatsoever. They've designed this darn thing to where, so if they, if, they were, if they were to invade us, they could use our ground equipment because it works just fine here. Their ground equipment doesn't work in our aircraft. So their 28, uh, it, it, it's crazy because uh, if, if we took over their their, their installation, their base or whatever, and they had a bunch of ground, we wouldn't be able to use their ground equipment. There, there's a couple little mods. You could use a, a knife or whatever, and shave off a little bit of the rubber and it would fit in there. But it's pretty standard. This is the 28 volt system here. So again, we don't have to modify because it was designed for American systems as well as, this is the, uh, the 208 400 hertz system. Works just fine with standard 208 400, uh, 400 hertz uh, um, uh, systems. Uh, I'll also mention, again, I don't know that much about weapon systems, but they did the same darn thing with the nose gun. You can put 50 cal rounds in there, so if they captured our ammo dump or whatever, they could put our 50 cal in, and it's a little loose, but it'll work. 12.7 is what they're using here. If we captured their bait, we couldn't put 12.7 in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a 50 cal. So it's just, it's, it's uh, I, you know, what it, it's enough to where it's like, oh, that's neat, oh, that's neat, and then after a while, you're like, wait, they're designing it this way. So, uh, where was I? Uh, this is air pressure, and presently it hasn't been running, so I don't have any air pressure here. Why do, would I need air pressure? And is this the air pressure that we're talking about to start the engines? No, this is, this is the compressed air that we're using here that we hold on board, uh, the brakes. So pretty much all Soviet aircraft, there, there's a, there, there are some exceptions. Some of the high speed stuff does uses hydraulic and some of the stuff that's operating in, uh, in lower temperatures, it uses hydraulic as well. But pretty much everything uses uh, pneumatic uh, brakes. Um, and again, this sounds like a truck. You pull the, pull the brake and you do a uh, let off the brake and you hear this pss, sort, of, sort of like a diesel truck or something like that. So I don't have any, uh, don't have any if, if we were taking off right now, I'd go get some nitrogen. We'd put a little bit of, uh, we'd put a little bit of nitrogen, put a little bit of air. This is a service panel for our hydraulics. So again, we have our, uh, and, and, and I'm sorry, I don't know. So one of them is going to be main, one of them is going to be backup, and one of them is going to be utility. I don't know if I just pointed to the right ones or not. Uh, but that's the idea here is that you have a supply, uh, you, you have a supply and a return for each of the three hydraulic systems. So while we're on the ground, we could put some uh, 400, we could put some 208 volt power, we could put uh, our hydraulic mule on here, and we could actually, with that configuration, we can do, we can test every system on board the aircraft except for one, and that's the generators. The generators actually have to be moving for there to be, but we've, we've then replicated, we can replicate and test all systems on the ground. So this is the battery on this side, and again, just the battery box, and we've, uh, we've, replaced, we've replaced their batteries, and, and the Soviets were notorious for having horrible batteries. And so what we did was, I'll just go ahead and show you. So, Whenever I came down to Lancaster, there was a bunch of L39 guys, and again, the problem with these lead acid batteries or whatever else is whenever you go inverted, then you've got, you've got the potential, you've got, you've got lead acid running all over your aircraft, so that's not a good solution. This aircraft doesn't go inverted, that's not, that's not the point. There's, they were already using gel cells here. So we looked at these gel cells, and they had these silly gel cells were $1,000 a piece or whatever, and so what we did was, uh, and these need to be updated, but uh, what we did was just found these Odyssey batteries, and these PC925s are great. And so you can see here, right here, we got two 12 volt batteries, so we're running this off of 24 volts. Again, 24 volts, it would like to see 27 volts, and we like to put 30 volts. So it's just, um, and, and we've tweaked our, um, 
uh, the system down to where we're not overvolting these guys right now so that they can charge up nicely. And in flight, these batteries have done really, really well. They've, uh, they, um, they hold the charge really nicely. They charge up and hold the charge really nicely. Something else, again, something we don't think about so much, but these aircraft designed by the Soviets, majority of the Soviet Union was way north of where we are. And so everything on this, you're like, what's that for? Why would they do that? And it's designed because they're designed to be operated in real cold temperatures de-icing systems and whatever else. This is this right here. Uh, you have this port right here and where the battery, I'll show you right here. This actually is where the batteries plug in. There's a bus back here. And there's also a place where this little rubber grommet fits in right here. What it does is it supplies heat. So it puts heat back here so that doesn't, your batteries don't freeze up. So again, just, just more uh, crazy little things are like, what would we use that for? And the answer is, we wouldn't use it at all. That doesn't make any sense with, with, with where we are here, especially in Texas. But um, anyway, uh, and, and then, you know, you've got the heat coming in. This is the little ventilation port over here. So those rascally, those rascally guys were thinking of everything here. Great engineers, great engineers. Again, same same uh, fold-up system. This door comes down, blades, uh, the, the wheel comes back in there with this door fixed on here, and then this comes back up in here in one motion. Check this right here, make sure we're in good shape here. It's a static wick right here. Uh, these are formation lights right here. We have, we have formation lights here, and then we also have lights that are used for formation on the blade tips. So we can turn the formation lights on whenever at night and flying in formation and it gives a really, really good set, it gives you really, really good sets of reference points to line yourself up and to keep a good, good tight form or get, keep your distance on the form, whatever you want there. Um, this, <laughs> this is broken. This is another one of those friend or foe indicators. It was actually a dome that's over here. So uh, I, I just, I, uh, we, we need to replace this. But again, this is not, this is not a system we're using. Um, another system that we ought to probably think about restoring on this aircraft, uh, I'm looking right here, this is a GoPro mount right here, and we have put a GoPro here on a number of really, really neat shots here. But this is actually, a, uh, inside here is a, let's see if we can get in here, it may not have been open since we painted the darn thing, but there's a camera in here. And this is actually the original camera. I need to look in there and see if there's any film in that camera. Um, it's just use it likely it's using 35 millimeter film and uh, so this would be a real interesting place to put a GoPro probably also um, and you can see there's just there's a filter here whatever and then uh, this right here I, I will tell you again uh, we, we talked earlier about this GoPro and the heat problem you put this right here and you can see all the carbon here what does that indicate exhaust yep we're getting direct heat downflow and again whenever this is lifted up and we're in flight nose is low we're getting heat right across here this GoPro doesn't stay on for more than 10 minutes, it doesn't seem like, once we're in flight. So, all right, and, and then, again, part of the pre-flight is we do lock these doors up, but part of the pre-flight is we wanna make sure that everything opens and closes, so I would just always come back over here, open this up, and uh, this is the other side of the crew compartment. It's actually, I don't know, I don't know if it'll see. This is actually kind of roomy. Now you put eight guys back here and this is not gonna be roomy. But for a couple of people, this is, this is uh, for me anyway, having been brought up in smaller helicopters, this is a lot of room. The uh, interesting thing also is there's a hallway right here. And I think you were looking down the hallway earlier. The hallway, um, you can see, yep, really sort of live in there. He's looking over the pilot's shoulder, checking the lights and all that uh, in, the, in the cockpit. There's also a bunch of breakers on either side. This little hallway, there's a whole set of breakers on this side and fuses and breakers on the other side. Push pull rods. There's a lot of things that the crew chief can actually work on while we're in the air and traveling in the aircraft. My crew chief, something must have happened with him. He's, he's, he's very, he always wants to make a point of saying, don't get near the door during flight. So I, I these things, these doors, whenever they come open, they're kind of like this and you know, could, could they be out here flapping? Yes, I, it's, it's, it would be a dangerous door to be open during flight. So, uh, in fact, we typically just ask people to throw the door down like that whenever they're coming out and that way it will catch or whatever. Um, one other thing I wanna show, oh, this is actually, uh, th this aircraft has a NBC system on it. So it has a filter on it for nuclear, biological, and chemical. And you'd say, well, how can you do that with it? 
we're pressurized also. So right here you can see the, um, the pressurization right along here. And yes, these are all active in systems. So this is just a like an inner tube, a real thin sort of inner tube or whatever that runs around here. And then it also runs around all of the openings here and also in the front cabin and in the pilot's cabin. And so what we do is we put a little bit of pressure in here and it inflates these and then it makes a good tight seal and you're not going to open the door whenever the seals are, are pressurized like that. So that allows for, uh, th then, then you can have a pressurized cabin and yeah, it's for pressurized cabin for altitude also so you don't have to have oxygen or auxiliary. This is, uh, this is going to be where a great place to put golf clubs or something, I guess, someday. This is actually where the friend or foe system was. There's a place here uh, where, where the base system was, <laughs> excuse me, and then there's also a control panel that I can show you later on. We've, we've actually put some extra breakers and, um, and switches up there in that panel that had plenty of area there, so we wanted to put some uh, additional avionics switches in. So this is where that, we're looking for some parts here. So if anybody knows where, if anybody has a couple of spare friend or foe systems, we're looking to put this into here just to see if we can get it working as well. This is the uh, co-pilot gunner, uh, co-pilot uh, seat right here. Co-pilot seat or co-pilot gunner. And this is, this is actually, this, this style of uh, canopy opening is if you've seen an L29, uh, even a MiG-21, very reminiscent of, of the way those are. You just push the, push the button here, open this, and then again, L-29, MiG-21, use exactly the same sort of stand to keep the, the cabin or keep the canopy open. Um, like I said, this is the co-pilot gunner seat here. So, um, look, most of the controls up here are, are not for flying the aircraft. The idea in this aircraft is you fly the aircraft from the top and you, you deliver the weapons from down here. So the controls are very minimal. You have two pedals, you have your cyclic, and you have your collective over here. And that's pretty much it. I have, a, I have an artificial horizon over here, but it's on a 45 degree angle. You get socked in the mess and a, 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 a horizon at 45 degrees becomes completely, in fact, I think it becomes more deadly than anything else. There's nothing else to use as far as navigation up here. You have a couple of gauges. If you want to come over here, actually, and look back over here, We have a couple of gauges here. Uh, well, I got uh, airspeed and metric. We have, uh, which is kind of useless as well. Um, we have uh, altitude and metric, uh, which air, airspeed and metric is actually okay. But airspeed, or excuse me, altitude and metric, um, completely useless. I usually just set it on zero, and if we're returning to the field, I kind of do the calculations here or whatever. Uh, we need to replace this. And then I have rotor speed right here, and then my N1, uh, my my uh, engine one, engine two. RPM uh, percentage right here. This is pretty much this and this artificial horizon here, my cyclic, my collective, and my pedals. That's it as far as being able to fly the aircraft from the front. All of the rest of the buttons and everything have to do with uh, launching weapons and, uh, and delivering, delivering the weapons. Um, oh, there's a clock right here. And I'm sorry, so there are some other things. There's my gear up, gear down. Um, we can do an emergency gear blow from up in the front. We can't start it from the front and we can't kill the engine from the front. So there is a way to deploy gear. You can't retract gear. Once you've deployed it here, you're, you're, you're kind of, you're, you're stuck in your situation. So, but when I get to the ground, can I stop the, I guess you can just sit there and wait for it to run out of gas or somebody else to run up and, and help you stop the engine from the back or whatever. Um, this is the guided missile. Yeah, this is where you you uh, do the various operations for the guided missile system. We get back out. I'll show you the how the windows come open. There's uh, some window or there's a, there's some louvers that cover to keep the um, the the 12.6 brass from going over into the missile site. Uh, so it's closed right now. But this is you basically you come in here, you side everything in, and then if you do have the controls active then you can actually use the controls. This would be extraordinarily uncomfortable, it seems to me, like to use this way. But you can guide the aircraft here. The other thing is these are guided missiles.
Maybe you would use this for the guns. I don't know. This, this is actually what you're using to move the guns left and right, up and down, like this. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's not mechanically coupled, obviously, because I just moved. It's not mechanically coupled with the gun. It's electronically coupled with the gun, which raises some real interesting possible engineering experiments in the future. But what you do here is you actually you put your hands here, and then you sight in over here, and this is where you're flying the missile into its target. And so you bring it over here. So um, you got this right here. You've got these controls right here. Again, we haven't fired anything. I haven't flown, uh, fired anything off this aircraft. So uh, I'm, I'm pretty unfamiliar with, uh, with the web, but looking forward to getting used to what, what's going on right here. So this is the, uh, the guided missile system right here. And then this is the gun system right here. Um, this is where you can set the guns. I guess your 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 launch rate of your guns. Uh, you can do some some uh, uh, launch rate. You, you can how, your burst rate. I guess is what it would be called of your gun. And then you can set different elevations and attitudes here. Um, there, there's drop angle, burst height, elevation differential. So there's a, there's some controls that you have over here that I have not, no idea how to use. And then there's also where is it? This is, um, I believe this is your flare system right here. There's also a flare panel in the back so that your, your decoy flares uh, to get away. You could launch that from here. Um, and then it seems like there's, oh, our, where's our UB-32? Then we have a UB-32 launch system as well somewhere in here. And, and again, you can you can dial up how many how many rockets do you want to send at a time? Do you want to send, you know, two a second, four a second, eight a second, 16 a second, or whatever? Um, so, um, yeah, so I've got some other radio controls in here, but for, for the most part, again, this is the, the this is the, uh, the, the this is the uh, cabin for delivering the weapon systems on uh, on on the other side. So, do you want to get in here, take some pictures, or do that after the fact? Okay. All right. Another friend or foe. These are actually pitot tubes right here. We have one on this side, one on that side. Very common Soviet system, even in L-29s, L-39s, MiG-23, MiG-21s, do the exact same thing. Uh, rather than joining these up, again, it's a redundant system. We've got an airspeed indicator here. We've got an airspeed indicator there. Why not connect them up separately? They do. Um, that way, if, if you do take some fire on one side and you have bad airspeed indicator, you can ask the person in the other seat, hey, what's, what's the current airspeed? And you've got a whole different system uh, calibrated or calculating that for you. It, up, up, up here, whenever I did like this, this would actually move this cone like this. And then it's just sending an RF signal back and forth, and that's how you're actually guiding the thing, is with a little, little bitty RF guidance system here. So this moves with this system right here. Um, I guess the rocket moves with the thumb, with the little thumb joystick. And then, as long as we're talking about that, let me excuse the uh, tow bar here. We left that on. But this is where, whenever you're using the missile system, this is what I'm actually looking at right here and siding or gauging everything in there. Um, apparently, there's some thermal capability in there to where it's helping you to track where the rocket is because you're looking at the back side, the fiery side of the rocket, so it helps you keep track of where everything is and all, and then also where, you're, where your target's going to go. So, and we skipped over the gun, but this is the, uh, this is the, uh, what is it, uh, a Yak B, I guess is what this is referred to as. This, this is a, this, this is not real. This is uh, actually the real one. I picked one of them up. It's over a hundred pounds. Again, one of the, one, to me, just from a size and, and it just, so you got a hundred pounds sitting, what, 25 feet forward of the of the uh, center of gravity of the aircraft and, and again whether it's on or off if you look at the uh, weight and balance it doesn't matter it doesn't move at a millimeter whether it's on or off and to me that's amazing you know we were looking at the tail rotor earlier and talking about it earlier a tail rotor gearbox is is about three times the size of a schweitzer main rotor gearbox or a robinson main rotor gearbox probably weighs 250 300 pounds and again that sits 45 feet aft of the center of gravity now, you take that off, and I'm sure it would affect the, uh, the CG of the aircraft. Um, we do the CG before every flight, obviously, but whether we're putting two people in, whether we're putting one person in, 
yep, this aircraft is actually certified to fly single pilot, um, which, which is a crime. You gotta always take somebody with you when you're in this aircraft. But I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, uh, uh, if you put five people in the back and one in the front, the CG doesn't move. It, it doesn't move a centimeter uh, for or aft. So um, the, the main reason for these right here, I'm sorry, I, I may or may not have mentioned this earlier. We close these right here because what you're doing whenever you're shooting the gun is you're exhausting the brass right here. So we don't want the brass to be uh, exhausted off into the optics. I say we, we don't want the brass to be exhausted into the optics. Actually a, uh, a, a data sensor is taking relative wind measurement information and feeding that into these analog computers to help you guide the guided missiles. And so there, there's a million different things about these aircraft, but one, one of the more interesting things is this right here. This is Plexi. This is Plexi on the cabin. That's Plexi on the cabin. This right here is, I, I guess they say there's no such thing as bulletproof glass, so this is bullet resistant glass, and it's just a bunch of Plexi and glass squeezed together in there. And that's direct. So if you get a glancing blow, I'm thinking you're probably going to be okay. But get in behind the glass. The the other thing, just from a survivability standpoint, that you, you if you're in this aircraft, one of the things you so if you're a helicopter pilot, you love the visibility that you have. If you're in this thing, you're going to say, man, this is a helicopter because you don't have any visibility. Um, you're down in this bathtub, so to speak. And I'm guessing whenever people are firing, you want the sides to be even taller. You want to be even lower in the in the bathtub, so to speak. So um, again, you can get in here. Your head's going to be a bit exposed if you're doing if you're uh, if you're sighting in the missile or whatever, but I guess if you're getting near the fire, you can sink down in your uh, sink down in your seat or whatever, um, and then get get in behind this. You know, get them get them straight ahead. Again, if I, if it were me, I'd say, yeah, I want that between me and whatever the bad guy is or the opposition is, uh, as opposed to just this plexiglass over here. Interestingly, also this right here, you say, well, but this this you know aluminum siding or whatever. no, this is not aluminum. This is all stainless steel up here. And this is like quarter inch metric, but this is roughly a quarter inch uh, stainless steel here. If you notice, you, you have rivets right here, so you have aluminum. Right here, you have all these screws and all these screws that are running up here. This is all one piece all the way here. This is all one piece of quarter inch stainless steel. Again, think how far up we are from the CG and how much weight this is. We've got some of these panels that we pulled off of another aircraft. They are crazy, crazy heavy. And there's an identical on the other side, and this door even has a piece of it right here. So again, this is this is some pretty good shielding that you have from, uh, from, from the opposition's fire or whatever. But what I think is really cool is we took one of these aircraft all the way down. We had a third aircraft that didn't make it here. It had an accident. Uh, ground accident being in, in transport. Um, this right here, you take it off and the whole front of the aircraft goes really floppy. This is actually an exoskeleton. This is actually support. This is stru a structural member within the aircraft. So in addition to being a shield, if you will, uh, armor for, for you and your pilot, co-pilot, whatever, it's also an exostructure and it's just, there's a very, very thin layer of support in here, just sort of the support where these things are screwed in. So it's, it's an interesting, interesting uh, design. Okay, so welcome to the cockpit of the MI-24 uh, Hind helicopter. Uh, just, uh, just we, we've already looked at the aircraft from the outside, but this is the inside. So again, this, this door is completely armored. The material along here, this is armor as well. This is uh, the exoskeleton armor that holds on the front of the aircraft. Um, we, I'm, obviously, I've already stepped in here. If we we're going to go up top, we would uh, use this as a step. This can also be used as a handle. There's a lot of places on the aircraft that are dual as both handles and steps. We step here and always tell the pilots, do not step here or else you can't use air conditioning. Because uh, And there's been a lot of people that have put their boots up here so you see the paint's been rubbed off. But, uh, basically, once you're in here, uh, you get it closed up whether you're cold weather or hot weather. It gets, it gets warm. And so you want your air conditioner. And so uh, this is the air conditioner. We don't want to use that as our uh, as our, our foot for our feet to be on that, because then we will tear it up and we won't uh, we won't have air conditioning for our flight. So um, we we just in here we keep some some uh, uh, books in here, and then we keep a little Zeus nut fastener here that helps us with uh, all the different uh, uh, batteries, uh, the black box in the back where we have our hobs, things like that. Just just something for a pilot pilot maintenance tool, if you will. So. Uh, if, if you look in here, so what, what we've got is, uh, this is just a little utility light right here, but uh, we've got uh, where our fuses begin, 
Uh, these are typically fuses that aren't serviceable by the pilot in flight. Um, you can see we've got them labeled. There was uh, Russian labeling. We've got them labeled with uh, some tape over the top of them in English. Typically, the um, typically the, the flight engineer is going to be, he's going to be here during uh, a flight. He's the one who actually kind of cranes around and is able to look at uh, the, the fuses. These fuses, if they blow, this little center section, it's, it's on a spring, and if it blows, it, it will came out, so you'll, you'll see it kind of hanging, a little piece of plastic on a, a circle hanging out of the middle of the fuse here. So he can crane around, look in here, pull the fuse, look at the value, and typically go in the back and find there's, there's additional fuses on this wall over here. He can find fuses that aren't currently in use or that we're not going to be using in flight. He can swap the fuse out if that's needed in flight. These down here are circuit breakers. Um, we, we bring all the circuit breakers on like so and then uh, we have right now we have the guns and uh, the arms we have those disabled because we're not those are not active systems on the aircraft right now but if we needed to bring all the all the breakers forward we would do that the same sort of breaker uh, uh, the, <laughs> bringing all the circuit breakers on the same uh, configuration exists over here on my left side so the general layout of the of the cockpit Whenever you're doing your pre-start, typically you're going to start over here, and you just sort of, there, there, there's a couple of switches that you move back and forth, but in general, the flow is that you move around the aircraft, and then finally you wind up over here on the right side. And then once the engines are started, then your attention starts to go to various different places in the cockpit that need your attention. Um, so, the, the different places in the, in the helicopter um, for example, over here, this is going to be navigation and communications over here. This right here is going to be your fuel section right here. This is going to be your fire control system and your fire panel right here. Now, all of these systems, all of the systems report up to this right here, which is your master control um, uh, indicator area right here. And th these are all just standard navigation gauges. So again, as we're starting up here, and just, just to kind of fill in the gaps, this is where all my navigation, my EFIS systems, are all down here underneath the collective on the left side. You got the gearbox, you got the uh, what you do with the gear right here within the box. Uh, this is our pneumatic systems over here. This is actually a radio system here, our neutral gas system here. These are our hydraulics right here, and then we have some nav lights that are sitting up here. They're kind of in an odd place, but uh, they're, they're, they're for landing. So they're right here where the gear is, and then you'd bring your, your lights on, things like that. Um, and like I said, there's some other gauges. This right here is where we cage our uh, gyros. We do a cage on our first gyro, and then we do a cage on our second gyro. Um, in fact, you know, I can actually... So I can bring some of the systems up. We've got the inverters on right now. So I'll go ahead and show you. We can, this is where my communication... I go intercom 1, intercom 2. I bring on the radios right here with those three. I'm not going to turn on my Doppler system or my radar altimeter while we're here in the hangar. But then what I will do is I'll go ahead and start bringing... The, uh, the gyro systems up right here and some of the um, uh, some, some of the I'll bring up my gyros so that some of the systems that need the gyros can uh, start getting calibrated and that that actually brings up a couple of lights over here that's starting to flash at me and then let's see I need to go ahead and bring mains to bat up over here as well and so the systems are slowly starting to come alive so um, again this this is fuel system right here these all these nine switches need to be up if we're starting the aircraft. Um, master control panel over here. Um, down here, I have a couple of air conditioner ducts. It looks like your standard airline air conditioner. Uh, to turn, I guess you turn them clockwise or turn them off and open them up, turning them counterclockwise. Um, we've got a G3X system that we just put in to this helicopter. We have displaced no um, instruments. There was just this blank space up here. It was this bank, a blank sort of uh, aqua marine that all the Soviets seemed to put in all of their aircraft, whether they're MiG-21, MiG-23, um, uh, MiG-21. All of them have kind of this green uh, yucky color or whatever. And there was just this big green area right here, so we decided to build up a box and put this. We've got some future experiments we're going to be putting in these areas right here, so we'll be expanding this box over time. Um, got our clock right here, which is one of the those hotly it seems like sought after devices whenever you go over and are picking up aircraft you always need to make a deal and say I've got to have clocks in them because they're the hardest things for those guys 
seriously to find are putting the clocks in in the uh, the aircraft mechanics apparently love having them families of mechanics love having them for christmas or whatever so uh the clocks are in hot demand over there um fuel this is our fuel indicator right here um we we uh we have one fuel gauge we're right now we're switched on total we want to see how many liters we have in our first tank we we put this switch to one if we want to look at tank two and again tank one is the service tank on the left side tank two is the service tank on the uh on the right side and then tank three is that vertical tank that's behind the crew cabin you can see i don't have any fuel in it right now and that that tank three falls directly down into tanks four and five and you can see four and five i have very little fuel also so you figure tanks one and two have about 300 liters each and what did it say we were at we should be right at 300 liters yeah we're just a little over 300 liters you can see there it's tank one tank two we're coming up i think it's technically 320 these, these are my rules of thumb i think one and two are 300 each tank three has 500 even though it has just a little bit less and then tanks four and five have 500 each so it has about a thousand liters so that makes up the 2100 liters that uh and i usually 2150 i think is technically the number of liters but that's how the breakout works here so we like to drive we like to drive the aircraft when we're in the total so we can see how many liters we total we have in the aircraft and you see right here we have about 700 liters in the aircraft so moving over here right after the engines get started this is where uh, the pilot's attention will move real quickly you want to make sure that it once your turbine is going and whenever you have a turbine going um you're, you're going to have heat you're going to have heat and, and that's going to indicate okay i have uh, the, the aircraft um, egt is going to start winding up here this is good then your eyes immediately move over here do i have uh do i have um, oil pressure in the turbine and then do i have a little bit of heat building up in the uh in the oil return out of that if i don't have either one of those moving then i need to immediately shut the aircraft down there or shut that engine down something's wrong so that's what we're looking at there so I, I deviated I'm in sort of the, uh, the the start procedure let me sort of go through the continue here so this right here it, as a part of the checklist you look at and you say uh, gauges uh, temps and pressures this is where the pilots pay, really this is where he's paying attention you have your temps and pressures for both of your engines and then for all your gearboxes are over here as well so you just want to make sure all your gearboxes are properly pressured up and they have they have proper temps and then also you're looking at your turbines um, and then as we kind of move back over into here this is where um, my environmental control systems are here where i put my filters on i put my air conditioning on put my heating on again this is a pressurized um, we have a pressurized cockpit here so this is where we, we monitor all those systems this is the de-icing system on the aircraft we don't use the de-icing system so I can't tell you about any of these uh, any of these right here and it, it's um, we just don't have it active we don't plan to activate it on this aircraft this right here is your AC power system so again the power in the aircraft once everything is started there's a uh, your, your derivative power that's going into that's going into electricity is coming out of the auxiliary gearbox behind us the auxiliary gearbox has two of these 200 amp 208 volt 400 Hertz uh, amp, uh, generators or uh, and and they are there's a synchronization we flip them both on here they're not obviously the aircraft's not on but we put these two on these two red lights would go out if the aircraft uh, if the generators were producing and then what we're looking for here is a green light that comes on here and it indicates that both of the generators are in sync with one another so that it can bring them together and then we can use the uh, the merged output of the generators we have two amp meters here that are also telling us individually how many amps the, the generators are having to produce for the load. And then we sort of move over here. Right now, the noise that's here in the background, I've got a uh, I've got an inverter on that allows some of the AC systems to be working. And this is what, whenever you're on the ground and you're on ground power, this is what you would be using. Whenever we get the power going on the on the airplane itself, we would flip this down. The light would go off. The light so light goes off. Light goes off. This light goes off. The green lights on there. So the the, uh, the goal here is to get rid of all the amber and red lights and get everything to go over to green. Once all of that happens, then there's a light over on the master panel that will go. It goes from red. It goes to dark as well. It goes out. So that that's what we've got here. The AC system here. That's where all the power in the aircraft. Once we're underneath un, under aircraft power, this is where it derives. Then we'll go over here and we'll flip on the inverters. These two lights would go off. That means we're making DC power out of our AC power. 
then I'd be able to flip off. Uh, right now I've got uh, external power on, uh, which is how we're doing this right now. I would go ahead and take my mains to bat off. I would put this off. And again, kind of cleaning up the lights over here, getting everything to go, uh, either to go off or to go to green. So um, that's that's kind of going left to right in the cockpit. Um, Mm. Yep, yep, good question. So, in in the rear cockpit, the primary purpose is to keep the aircraft in the air and to keep the systems working with one another. And, and truly, this airplane, this, this aircraft, the pilot sitting in the back is less of a pilot and more of a systems manager. Um, it, 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 and and I'm, I'm not being falsely proud or anything, it doesn't take a lot of skill to fly this aircraft, per se just to hover it around and to fly it. Now you get into maneuvers and it takes some, some real skills to do that. But what you're really doing here is you're keeping the aircraft, you're keeping it flying, but you've got to keep the systems interconnected. The way the Soviets did things was they didn't build, they didn't say, okay, we're going to build an aircraft around this gun and it's going to support this. They would tend to take things off the shelf. They would take a system that works, a Doppler system, for example. That already works. Don't go reinvent it. Same Doppler system that's in here is in the MiG-23. Pull it out, stick it in. But the Doppler system needs to work with the navigation system. Well, the navigation system might be off of an old tank system that they developed in World War II or something like that. Um, another example is the radar altimeter. Why go reinvent the radar altimeter? Just go ahead and, and uh, use the radar altimeter that's used on a similar aircraft or that would fit in the space that's allocated. The point is, you've got all of these systems that are sort of put together from uh, other technologies, and your primary purpose in this seat is to keep the systems linked together, keep the amber and red lights off, keep the green lights where there's green lights on, and keep the aircraft going straight and keep it off the ground. Now, wh wh one thing that you can do here is there, like a, there, there are backup systems. So what you primarily do here is you fly the airplane. What you primarily do in the nose of the aircraft is you, you use the weapon system. If something happens to the person up front and you need to want you, you need to use some of the weapon systems, this is your this is your weapons panel right here. So this is sort of the backup weapons panel, if you will. And as you can see, you're flying. This is not comfortable to get down here. You're not going to be flying the aircraft. You're simply working on bringing the weapon systems online. Um, I, the, the, this aircraft presently doesn't have the weapon systems active. We're we're slowly in the process of bringing them active, and. Um, I'm not going to be able to give you a whole lot of insight. These are uh, labeled. They've been labeled in English. So um, you read the switches and you know as much as I do about this. But the bottom line is primarily up in the, in the top cockpit, you're flying the aircraft, keeping the systems linked together. But you could, in a backup capacity, you could, for example, store the gun in the forward neutral position and then start firing the gun. You can't slew the gun from the back seat like you can in the front seat. But I do have a switch somewhere in here where I could activate that and it would pull the gun to the center position and up to the neutral position. So then I could start using my gun sight here to actually uh, aim where my, where my bullets are going here. And again, I, you know, there's a lot of little moving parts here. We've left all of the original equipment to the extent we can in this. I can't tell you exactly I can't tell you exactly how this is. I can tell you we've turned this on before and there's a little crosshatch that appears kind of like in this uh, the HUD system here or whatever. That um, it, it does provide a little crosshatch there. So I'm imagining you get your tracers out there, you figure, figure out where it is at whatever range you're at, and then you make the appropriate corrections and then you uh, you take out the target. Again, I'm, I'm guessing. So, but yeah, that's what this panel is right here. That's your, uh, that's kind of the backup weapon system for the, uh, for the aircraft. So, uh, as I've said, the Doppler system even works here. So there's this there's this little thing right here. And again, this is our this is our, our notes for for uh, this is actually our, our cheat sheet here. Our master control panel is still all written in Russian. So the question is, okay, do you read Russian? No, but I can look over here, and right now I've got uh, this red light on, and I've got this yellow light on, and I can come over here, and it says I have a main transmission pressure uh, low main transmission pressure and then I've got an electrical system panel uh, caution light here as well so yeah that makes sense I don't have any pressure in the gearbox because it's not running and I do have red lights over on the electrical panel as we saw earlier so that, that's what this is here but underneath here is a plotter let me see if I can get to it here this plotter very cool 
it's um i'll put this back up the plotter is actually kind of an old etch-a-sketch if you will you, you turn these knobs here horizontal and vertical what you would do is you would put your uh, you'd put your sectional behind there now it, it you really can't put u.s sectionals in here but you'd put your metric adjusted uh, uh, sectional in here you would adjust it to let's say where you are let's say i'm right on the intersection right there and then you would start the doppler system and then this cross would start actually moving around with where you are it's just taking the doppler input it's adding the north south and it's norting uh north south relative to the aircraft and east west or left right relative to the aircraft it's putting it in here and then positionally it's making adjustments for where the aircraft is also with with the map of the earth and so this is just using uh, old Doppler technology to actually move the crosshairs on this. This system is actually working on this aircraft. Uh, and it's just as inaccurate as, uh, as, as it was whenever it came off the, off the line. Again, it's very accurate whenever you're within where it starts, but as you get further away, and, and again, you, you look at some of the old piloting skills, the pi piloting skills, you think you're somewhere, but then you find a landmark and you readjust your bearing. That's what you would do with this. You'd cross over a water tower, You'd kind of move the controls so you recenter the controls on the. Uh, you'd recalibrate your controls on top of the water tower or whatever. So, anyway, working system. Um, we've had some people that are trying to talk us into putting some GPS screens here, but I want to keep the. Uh, we want to keep the old, the old stuff as, uh, as as usable as we can. So, once you've gone through and you've set all your switches in your pre-flight to start the aircraft, once again we start back over on the left side of the aircraft. So there may be a couple of additional switches that our checklist would tell us we need to bring online as well in advance of the start. But this is where we actually do our start. So this, this line right here demarks on the back side. This is where my APU starting control is. And on the forward side, this is where my, um, my main engine start is going to be. So there's a number of different types of starts we can do. We can do a start without fuel. We can do a start with spark. Um, we, we can do a, spark, a start with fuel and no spark. So there's just just from a standpoint of checking uh, the, the, the mechanical say let's run fuel this time and not run spark or whatever it's just whatever the okay but mainly we we the pilots would just simply put it in the start position you'd push the white button here it starts a what what I refer to as a music box because if you've ever seen an old player piano that has like a belt that goes through and it's got the little whatever for the different keys that need to be struck we, we've got one of those in the back of this and it starts this thing starts up and it's on a 60 second belt and it's got little dots in there where these little switches and contacts are and so it goes through the progressive system of starting up the APU by by uh, applying power first and then it, it applies to the second stage of power that would be the next switch then it actually connects a switch to start sensing whether it has appropriate back pressure if it doesn't then it'll shut the system off I mean, this, this thing will not let it, it, it's actually set up to where if things are not going correctly, it will shut itself down so it doesn't have to rely on a pilot to figure that sort of stuff out. So it, it, it's, it's, actually, it's very cool. So there's a, there's a music box in there. If we want to stop the music box or if we want to reset the music box, then we push the red button here. And that'll stop the process. It'll disable all the little micro switches that are in there. And then it will run this little belt back to the beginning and then we can start again. We've, we've had problems with a couple of them where the, the little motor was running them just a little bit over to where it was just like a second and a half. Whenever it ended, it was a second and a half into the start of the next cycle, and it wouldn't start because everything was a second and a half off. So you have to stop it, reset it back to the beginning, and let it go through the full cycle so that we can get a good APU start. And again, remember, the APU is critical to start the engines because the engines are started by uh, via air pressure or so-called huffer system. And so... That's where we would go here. We would go to a left engine start here uh, or right, whichever way. We'd go left engine start. We'd push the start. And then my attention would move to the front of the panel. And, and again, kind of older technology. So my finger stays depressed for about 15 seconds to make sure. And then my attention starts. I'm looking for heat. Once I got a heat uh, indication or EGT indication, then my eyes start moving back over to the pressure gauges and temp gauges to make sure that we've got a good start. If we've got a bad start, then um, uh, then I would push this. Now, a uh, real key thing that I missed in the whole start of this thing. Now, the APU, the fuel starts automatically. Once I see that we have about 15% on my N1, 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce power. So I'm going to do that as though I'm flipping. Okay, I've got left engine start. I press left engine start. I start to get up to about 15% on my N1. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce power by letting that down right there. I've got my cocks closed. So I've got all the fuel gauges and the fuel cocks closed, so I'm not doing anything here. But now I've introduced power at that point, or I've introduced fuel, excuse me. At that point in time, now my attention is looking. As soon as I get heat, I know I've got an ignition. As soon as I got an ignition, I need to start moving over to the pressure and temp gauges. So that's kind of the, that, that's the, the uh, rough, without me looking at this, uh, the uh, checklist, that's kind of a rough idea of how you start the aircraft. After the left engine or right engine, whichever one you choose to start, after it started, you go through a procedure. There's a couple items on the checklist. You do a couple of hydraulic checks. The, the uh, rotor blades are connected to the engine, so it's not like you introduce rotor or whatever. Once you get everything going, once it gets up to about 25, 30%, the rotor mass is gonna start turning. And so we get the rotor mass turning, then we can start doing some hydraulic checks and things like that before we start the second engine. On this aircraft, just to kind of even out the starting of the first engine and the second engine, number one on the left, number two on the right, what we do is on odd number days, we start the odd number engine first, and then on even number days, we start the even number first. And then how do we keep up with that? Well, if we start the even number one first, then we start the odd one second. So we're gonna be in the left position. And the second time we're here, we look down and it says left. So even the pilot doesn't have to think about that kind of system. It's, uh, it's almost pilot proof, if you will. So anyway, that's how you get the air, that's how you, basically how you get the aircraft started. That sort of completes our walk around on the outside and our little runabout on the inside of the aircraft from, uh, uh, from the MI-24 Hind Model D helicopter.